I wanted to talk to you all about COVID-19 from a primary care outpatient perspective. You have a handout that uh, is associated with this talk uh, that I think will be useful. I think it's also important to note that it is the beginning of April of 2020 and this is obviously something that is rapidly changing and we're learning new things. So it's important for you to know uh, the date uh, that this video was made. Uh, starting with transmission, um, obviously respiratory droplets are the single most important means of transmission. It's why we tell people that it's so important to cover their mouth and to do a really good job covering their mouth, especially when they're coughing and sneezing. It's why we ask people to be six feet away, um, uh, etc. Um, and the other piece that uh, is important regarding this is uh, masks. And for our patients to generate some sort of homemade mask when they go out in public, when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the, the bike path to take a walk or to walk around a pond uh, and they're keeping their six feet distance, it's still important uh, that they should be wearing a mask uh, in order to flatten the curve. Uh, so, uh, also important, but not quite as important as respiratory droplets are surfaces. And it's why, of course, that we need to do a good job washing our hands regularly and not touching our face. Uh, airborne transmission is a little controversial. It's uh, pretty unlikely. Um, it certainly becomes uh, a possibility when you think about medical procedures uh, that involve uh, aerosolizing, like extubating a patient. And um, in that case, from a, a healthcare worker point of view, that's where an N95 mask or uh, proper protective equipment uh, becomes more important. Uh, there's another issue about vertical transmission and uh, that uh, has only been studied uh, in a very small study in China and in, in that study there was, there was no vertical transmission. Uh, from an onset point of view, uh, you all know that incubation period is 2 to 14 days with an average of about 5 days and you know uh, the, the trajectory is when you get your first symptoms uh, uh, it takes about five days before most people are starting to get short of breath and a, and a viral pneumonia picture. And about 10 days out is often when people will, uh, if they are going to go into respiratory fa failure, they will enter respiratory failure at about the 10 day point, typically an ARDS picture. And it's, it's typically a result of the cytokine storm. Um, of course, there's so much variability with this onset, but those are the averages and those are the typical patterns that people are seeing. Um, uh, this cytokine storm that people are talking about generates multi-organ failure and often can happen in a matter of hours. Uh, when people, if people are fortunate enough to be extubated after they're intubated, it's typically about 10 days after intubation. So it's a long haul uh, being intubated. From a testing point of view, currently uh, we're, we're not ready uh, for antibody testing yet. We hope in the near future that will be ready. Uh, right now PCR testing is what's being used and I'm hearing about 70% sensitivity. So the bad news of that is is 30% false negatives, which you don't hear people talking about, that, but that's, that's pretty significant. And that sensitivity will actually go down early in the disease before people are symptomatic or if they've just been symptomatic for a day or two. Um, that sensitivity will even go less than 70% or if there's poor technique with the testing, that sensitivity can go down. Interestingly, uh, CT scans uh, seem to be more sensitive than the PCR test. Uh, reading the, the, the uh, images of the CT scan. I'm not suggesting that we use CT scans as a screening tool, but it's just interesting to know that. Um, at this moment, testing is being prioritized for healthcare workers and patients who are sick enough to be hospitalized. I think very soon we should be expanding testing pretty dramatically uh, to a much larger uh, population. The prognosis for COVID-19 about 80% of people will get no symptoms or very self-limited uh, symptoms and get better pretty quickly. About 15%, which is a pretty high percentage, will get sick enough to need 
to be hospitalized and about 5% of people who get infected um, are sick enough to be in an ICU um, and require a ventilator. And uh, if you do get a ventilator, uh, I'm hearing that about 80% mortality rate once you get to that point uh, of ventilator. Um, and uh, in terms of mortality, uh, we're it's being quoted all over the map. I think it's probably going to be settling out at about a 1% mortality rate or maybe a little bit lower once we know all the people that are infected and the denominator settles out. Uh, clinical manifestations also are very variable and uh, we're seeing about 90% of people getting fever but maybe only half of those who are having experiencing fever at the onset of their symptoms. Most people are experiencing fatigue and malaise, and uh, that's at about 70%, about 60% uh, with a dry cough, some of which are pre producing sputum, but for most people, that's a dry cough. Uh, about 40% are experiencing a decreased appetite, some of whom are experiencing uh, a loss of smell and taste with that decreased appetite, which is a very interesting aspect of COVID-19. About a third of people are experiencing muscle aches and shortness of breath. And what's so interesting about COVID-19 is the silent hypoxemia uh, that is so common where people's distress around shortness of breath is there but not dramatic, but the pulse ox uh, uh, lowering is much more dramatic. Uh, we're seeing GI symptoms uh, that are uh, much less common uh, but can indicate more severe disease, some nausea without vomiting, some belly discomfort with some loose bowel movements. But really the hallmark of this virus, which is so fascinating, is the um, hypoxemia with uh, less than you would expect dyspnea and shortness of breath, which is why we might start doing some home monitoring by giving patients uh, inexpensive pulse ox machines uh, to take home with them. Uh, moving forward. Um, when you think about influenza compared with COVID-19, uh, influenza is a much more rapid onset. There's typically more fever uh, or higher fevers and body aches with influenza, typically more congestion and more nausea, vomiting, diarrhea with influenza, but less cough and less shortness of breath in people with the flu or influenza. Another interesting difference between influenza and COVID-19 is people with influenza uh, are prone to getting a secondary bacterial pneumonia, whereas that complication is very uncommon with COVID-19. Influenza uh, typically has a much shorter incubation period than COVID-19 with only uh, uh, one to four days. Um, and influenza is much more likely to affect children, whereas COVID-19 doesn't seem to be affecting children very much at all. When you think about risk factors for severe disease and mortality with COVID-19, uh, some of the big risk factors are uh, smoking. It's a great time to work with patients on smoking cessation. I think there's more motivation than there has been perhaps ever to do that. Uh, there's also motivation to get younger. That's a hard, uh, harder counseling uh, to do. Folks who are over than 55 years old um, are... Um, uh, at higher risk, and uh, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, uh, pre-existing heart and lung disease such as asthma, COPD, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, and anything that can cause immunosuppression like chemotherapy, uh, uh, steroid use, um, uh, a transplant, uh, all increase people's risk. And so when you think about an overall mortality, we talked about settling out around 1%, pretty rare in children, as we talked about. Uh, and then if you look at by decade, folks who are less than 50, it looks like about a 0.5% mortality rate. And then in your 50s, about 2%, 60s, 4%, 70s, 8%, 80s, 16% is what is being quoted at this time. When you think about treatment for COVID-19, some important concepts to keep in mind. Uh, it would be ideal to avoid steroids, if possible, in a patient with COVID-19. Uh, 
Uh, ibuprofen has been uh, a little bit controversial. Uh, there has not been clear evidence guiding us around NSAID use, although people are really trying to uh, use acetaminophen, Tylenol, instead of NSAIDs. Uh, ibuprofen may in fact increase the severity and the duration of a COVID-19 infection. There's also talk about the use of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin reception, receptor blockers, ARBs. Um, the thing about those two classes of medications is they're very common, obviously used for hypertension, uh, and they could potentially make COVID-19 infection worse or better. It's unclear. Um, in, in terms of pathophysiology, COVID-19 seems to be binding to ACE receptors. So what happens um, is with a use of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, there's going to be upregulation of those receptors, uh, which could make the infection worse. On the other hand, ACE inhibitors and ARBs may protect against lung disease. So this one could go either direction, and we're waiting on more evidence uh, uh, to guide us there. But the, the long and short of it is, is if somebody's on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and gets a COVID-19 infection, we are not recommending for people to stop that medication. Of course, you've heard about hydroxychloroquine, which is better than chloroquine and may decrease severe uh, progression of disease in COVID-19 by preventing that cytokine storm. Uh, the jury is still out. There are a lot of trials with this, uh, so we should be hearing more about that soon. Um, there's some antiviral agents like um, remdesivir, uh, which may hold some promise and work well with MERS. Uh, convalescent plasma may be helpful. Um, and um, interesting report about statins potentially being helpful by lowering the incidence of severe viral pneumonias uh, and of course decreasing cardiac complications. Uh, and statins may also have a role in increasing the immune response in viral infections. That's some anecdotal stuff, uh, but certainly if a patient got a COVID-19 infection was on a statin, we would encourage them to stay on the statin. There may be some benefit. Uh, from a laboratory point of view, some of the more common labs we're seeing go up are C-reactive protein, CRP, ferritin, and liver enzymes, AST, ALT. Um, and we're seeing um, leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, mild leukopenia and thrombocytopenia um, with COVID-19 infection as well. So what is the primary care role uh, with COVID-19 infections? It's actually quite critical. Um, one of the things we're doing is certainly triaging uh, any patients with respiratory symptoms, including asthma and COPD, and helping them stay healthy and helping uh, keep them out of the emergency department and uh, the hospital unless appropriate. Um, the other thing is that uh, acute and chronic disease uh, have not decided uh, to leave us all other acute and chronic diseases just because we're in the midst of a pandemic. So we really have an important role to manage the health of our patients and keep our patients healthy with all of the acute and chronic disease that they're experiencing right now and again, to keep them out of emergency departments and hospitals uh, and keeping them as healthy as possible, teaching them how to maximize their immune system uh, by walking more, sleeping more, uh, eating healthier foods, uh, kind of leaning plant-based and avoiding sugar. And um, I think a lot of patients have become really motivated and have some more opportunity now to walk more than they've been walking, exercise more than they've been exercising, sleep more than they've been sleeping, uh, prepare what they're eating, and eat more home-cooked food. And uh, I think what we're seeing in a lot of patients is what I like to call the COVID-15. Uh, the opposite of the freshman 15, where you gain 15 pounds, the COVID-15 is we're seeing a lot of patients who are losing weight because of these opportunities for wellness. And we can certainly encourage our patients to take advantage of some of these opportunities and um, prepare their bodies and crank up their immune systems so that if they happen to encounter COVID-19, they're ready uh, as the healthiest version of themselves. I hope this was uh, helpful for you all. Uh, there certainly, we'll certainly need to have some updates and um, let's keep on uh, working hard to keep our patients as healthy as possible.